A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Professor Leo Kestens uh, for accepting our invitation to take the pain flying down thousands of miles to spend some time with all of us this afternoon. We heartily welcome you, sir. Uh, I thank Professor Ghansam Krishna to agreeing uh, to preside over this function. Thank you, sir. I welcome you. Uh, uh, I thank uh, my colleagues uh, from the university, outside the university, uh, scientists from various uh, labs uh, around uh, us, uh, and the students, the research scholars. Uh, I heartily welcome all of you uh, to make your time out uh, to attend uh, to uh, in this in this uh, lecture. And uh, uh, let me let me. Uh, uh, give you uh, some brief introduction about the school. Uh, our school basically was started in the academic year 2008-09 uh, with an objective to uh, impart research-oriented education. Um, uh, currently, the school runs five programs, three masters and two PhDs, uh, masters in materials engineering, nanosciences and technology, and manufacturing science and engineering and two PhD programs in materials engineering and nanosciences and technology. Uh, so since inception, we have uh, graduated uh, uh, around 61 PhD students, and uh, currently 44 PhD students are on rolls. Uh, we have graduated 165 uh, MTech students, and currently 21 uh, are under on, on rolls. Uh, we have trained almost 150 uh, BTEC students, you know, summer intern students. Um, we have uh, eight faculties, including uh, the dean of the school. Uh, altogether, since inception, we have generated more than 22 crores of external funding. Uh, our uh, colleagues all together, they have published more than 450 uh, uh, scientific papers. Uh, this is just a snapshot about uh, our school. Um, I'm sure uh, we are going to have an exciting hour in the next few minutes. I welcome you all once again in this uh, distinguished lecture series. Thank you very much. So thank you for briefing about school development and uh, research outcomes. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Professor Gansham Krishnagaru to address the gathering. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, special welcome to Professor Leo uh, Kestens. Uh, <clears throat> I have a difficult role to play because I am sort of representing the Vice Chancellor here. So on behalf of the university and the Vice Chancellor, I welcome Professor Leo Kestens to the university. Thank you for accepting our invitation, uh, spending time uh, with the university community and uh, also delivering this uh, distinguished lecture. Uh, <clears throat> I also represent the Institution of Eminence, uh, uh, which is a sort of a status accorded to the university for what uh, has been the achievement uh, by the university community at large over a period of time. And we are one of uh, 11 institutions in the country and only one of three universities uh, in the country to have been given this status. So uh, this is a, a special sort of uh, status and it is also uh, gives us a, a lot of responsibility uh, because one of the aims of uh, objectives of being an institution of eminence is essentially uh, to attract um, you know, improve the perception and visibility of the university. So we are particularly happy that you have uh, agreed to come to the university, and I hope that you will take uh, back good memories of uh, the school, the university. If you have time, please walk around. Uh, it's a large campus, a lot of greenery. Uh, there is enough wildlife to be careful about, uh, and uh, uh, the morning walk is particularly uh, nice. Uh, I, I also believe, I'm a great believer in sort of uh, 
uh, science without borders and uh, all science is global in nature. And um, also the fact that uh, uh, Professor Leo is a physicist who's now straddling the interface of physics and engineering is particularly interesting to us because uh, University of Hyderabad is a multidisciplinary university. And a lot of us collaborate across disciplines. And uh, we would like to have uh, more collaborations which uh, cut across disciplines. And one of the hopes of uh, such visits is essentially that um, a person of your eminence uh, comes here, uh, mentors the faculty members and students, and helps us to look at directions in the future. Uh, and I hope you will have fruitful discussions uh, uh, with the faculty of the school and the students of the school. Uh, and the, uh, the School of Engineering uh, is actually very interestingly named, uh, as you will notice. There are two centers which are named like that. Uh, one is, it, it's not a school of engineering, it's called the School of Engineering Sciences and Technology. So uh, the emphasis of the School of Engineering Science is essentially to also look at the science part of the engineering. And therefore, the talk that you're giving is particularly relevant to us. We have another center which uh, also I'm part of, which is also called Electronic Science and Technology, where again our training is uh, you know, at the interface of uh, the electronics engineering and the electronic science. Uh, so. <coughs> Uh, I think this topic actually, uh, although it sounds very technical, is actually very broad in its uh, uh, perspective. And hopefully at the end of talk, uh, there will be a diverse audience, so we'll all get something to, uh, you know, learn from you. Uh, and I am sure that uh, the young uh, undergraduate students who have come will also learn a lot from here. So uh, thank you again uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, delivering the distinguished lecture at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your kind words about university and especially for mentioning science without borders. That really a meaningful sentence for all the young students and research researchers here. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Jay Gautam to give introduction about the speaker. Please welcome, sir. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot. It's a very much uh, privilege for me uh, being, first of all, a student of uh, Leo Kestens. It's a very long journey for me to, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to talk about uh, him. Uh, it's something like a guru or teacher you always admire, so, but, some details you might have seen already on the flyer. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that and a uh, little bit more detail I will share uh, along with you. So Leo Kestens, uh, he obtained uh, this uh, master degree in applied physics from Ghent University uh, uh, in 1987. So uh, as he said, like uh, it's MSc in applied physics and from Ugent, he moved to Catholic University of Leuven, where he has made the switch from physics to uh, material science and obtained the PhD in 1994 with a dissertation, uh, dissertation uh, which uh, the topic was role of crystallographic texture in electrical steel, which are used as a magnetic flux carrier in wide variety of applications. So this switch over itself uh, suggests what uh, uh, Professor Gansham uh, Krishna said, like uh, without boundaries. So you can see how uh, much challenging a step he took. And whenever, when I started my PhD career, also if somebody wants to learn the texture or crystallography, I think it's one of the very good material to start with. So I feel proud that, and also uh, learning that uh, he started uh, similarly his career. And then he moved for a postdoc uh, to McGill University and uh, did his postdoc with Professor John Jonas uh, in McGill University in Montreal. Uh, 
So this is Professor John Jonas, like the students who are from metallurgy, material science. If you are reading mechanical metallurgy, you will see the name of John Jonas if you look at the references several times. He is one of the very uh, good uh, mechanical behavior, uh, how to say, expert in the world. And um, I, it was a very uh, strong collaboration, I think, uh, what uh, Professor Leo has. And then after the postdoc, he came back to Belgium and he did uh, join the Center for Research in Metallurgy, which is the collective research center of research groups in uh, Benelux steel industry. So this is again, it's a consortium which is uh, in the Ghent University, is just behind the department where uh, this uh, several steel industry from Belgium and uh, let's say sometime European Union all together, uh, they use this uh, facility. It's a wonderful facility they have with all thermomechanical processing and uh, steel related research. So where he, he worked uh, uh, for some time, and then he uh, started working in uh, Ghent University uh, with his own research group in 1998, and this research group uh, basically on crystallographic aspects of physical metallurgy. And since 2005 onward, uh, he got the chance to uh, had the group of microstructure control in metals in TU Delft. I was at the same time there, so I also transitioned along with him in the Delft uh, University of Technology in Netherlands. So he had been there almost uh, three, four years. Then he got a very huge grant, I think prestigious grant, which uh, is, was given to him in Belgium. So he moved back as a full professor and heading the group uh, of uh, metal science and technology in the department of uh, Electron, electromechanics, systems, and material, metals engineering. So, so he is still continuing there. And also at the same time, when he left Delft, he is still continuing as a guest professor in Technical University Delft. So uh, he holds the, you can imagine it's very difficult to supervise and, uh, and do the, the life, uh, I would say, after research. It's, I mean, I admire him that how he manage all those things and he give full attention to the researcher and everything. So having a group in, at the time particularly when I was there, there were 20 students in Delft, I would say, and almost 10 to 15 in Ghent, and he managed all very well. Apart from that, I would like to share some more detail about him, that he is a, a member in the International Committee of Texture of, uh, texture of Materials which organizes the international conference. It's one of the very important uh, society which uh, related to the res uh, texture of materials. And then he also is a member of International Committee of Recrystallization and Grain Growth. And he organized one uh, conference, I would say, three, four years ago. So this is also very prestigious uh, society. Then apart from that, uh, uh, he is a referee uh, and uh, in several uh, journals, and particularly to name like this uh, uh, prestigious Ecta Materiala, Scripta Materiala, Material Science Engineering, material uh, Metallurgical and Material Transactions, and occasionally for this uh, Nature uh, journal. And he is also editorial member uh, in, uh, in the Scientific Advisory Board of uh, Steel Research International uh, Journal. He's also a member in the Scientific Advisory, Advisory Board of the International Journal of uh, Plasticity. So it's, it's uh, I have to say, this variety of expertise he has, it's tremendous. And at the same time, he got uh, the award. I would like to talk about Young Scientist Award at this uh, conference of recrystallization and grain growth. So one of his uh, work on the grain growth is very well recognized. There are several papers on this. I mean, they are well cited. And at the same time, there is one more award, which is a Swabamura Award uh, of Iron and Steel Institute of Japan. So. Uh, so uh, I would say with these words, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot to talk about being, uh, how to say, student for him, but I have to stop here and looking forward to his lecture. I have heard him several times and I'm again curious to one more lecture. So I welcome all of you and uh, yeah, let's uh, all go ears to him. Thank you, thank you all for coming and uh, yeah.
So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, first I would like to thank all of you for these very warm and hardly uh, welcome words, which make me blush a little bit, to be frankly. Uh, so, uh, it is, um, uh, I, I have to contradict the Dean in one word, because you said it was painful to, uh, to come here. No, it was not painful, it was my pleasure. So. Uh, I think it's the fifth or sixth time that I'm in India, but the first time here in the South, uh, and it's always a, a, a pleasure. So, uh, yeah, um, I, to be honest, I don't recall the number of times that I was in India exactly, so it means that I, I, I really am comfortable. <laughs> so, and uh, I'd like to thank you uh, a lot, uh, the distinguished audience also for uh, attending uh, this lecture. Uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to tell a little bit more today uh, about uh, uh, modeling and, uh, but what I also wanted to say uh, before uh, my talk that is I'm very much open to uh, collaboration. So if you have uh, any ideas uh, of things uh, that I'm going to say that, oh, I would like to know more about that or uh, I would like to uh, have more information, please uh, come to me and uh, I'm, uh, we see what we can do uh, together. Um, so, having said that, one of the core um, activities also uh, already uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Professor uh, Jay is what is the, uh, it's about microstructure. Um, so, actually, um, if I were to ask you, actually, what is a microstructure of a material? Um, I think we can, uh, there is a long, uh, we can have long debates about it, uh, but there is a very nice definition that I uh, found in a book, Computational Material Science by uh, Professor Rabe from the Max Planck Institute, which he himself refers to uh, Professor Hasen from a, a book in German. Uh, and that said that, uh, what is the microstructure? The microstructure can be defined as the totality of all thermodynamic non-equilibrium lattice defects on a space scale that ranges from angstrom to uh, two meters, for, from submicroscopic sub -microscopic, uh, length scale to uh, the uh, macroscopic length scale. So please bear in mind that yeah, most metals that we, we know, that we use for all types of applications, they are are crystallographic materials. I think you would agree with me. They are made up of, of crystals, and crystals are regular repetitions of unit cells in, in 3D space. Uh, they are, are, but if you come to think of it, very many uh, important material properties, they are not only determined by this crystal structure by itself, but by the defects in that crystal structure the lattice defects, we have vacancies, uh, uh, dislocations, grain boundaries, uh, solute atoms, and so on. It are these defects which make the crystal imperfect that gives us the right variety of uh, metallurgical structures. Eh? If, in fact, um, I have been working a lot on, on steel metallurgy, and steel is, well, it's essentially iron mixed with carbon and, and some other uh, 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 alloying elements, you could say it's, it's iron with, with uh, herbs and, 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 sp and spices. Uh, so, and it are these that gives the, the property to, to the steel, okay? And um, this is all about, um, so I'm, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit uh, about this and how we can model this. Um, I know that uh, this is a painting uh, from a Belgian painter, I don't know uh, if, if some of you know him, his name is uh, René Magritte, he lived in the 20th century, and this is his most famous painting. It says, in, it's French, but it says, this is not a pipe. So, it's a big, the painting in, in reality is, is quite big, and it says, this is not a pipe. So, you have an idea why he wrote, why he, he, he expressed this. It's a picture of a pipe, exactly. And that's very important because very often people look at microstructure. We make pictures of microstructure and we tend to think of it, this is the microstructure. Well, actually, paraphrasing uh, Magritte, 
this is not exactly the microstructure. The microstructure is what I've shown before. It's the set of all lattice defects, the assembly of all lattice defects. That's the microstructure. But if you make a picture, you have some image of the microstructure. And there are some things that are in the image, and there are many other things which are not in the image, which even we are perhaps not aware of. But I, I insist on that you are always aware on, on that you are aware of this limited view that we always have in one way or another. So because yeah, so actually each image that we make by microscopy or each measurement actually only selects some part of the defects. Yeah. So uh, you, there are limit, you have limitations by scale, by resolution, by, by field of it, all kinds of, of, of limitations. Okay, so then if we want to have an understanding of what is happening in, in, in the material, so if you um, I, you could say, I, I, that's a, a thought that I uh, started, but I, I didn't finish it. So if you, if you deal with steel, in fact, and you want to make a better steel, uh, stronger, more ductile, more fatigue resistant, better corrosion resistant, or whatever. So actually what, what you're doing is managing lattice defects. So you are trying to organize the lattice defects uh, in such a way that they produce you the best possible uh, properties of the materials. So, if you want to do this with any scientific, uh, in a scientific manner, uh, that means that you have a scientific understanding of, of what's happened, of what's happening, uh, based on, on first principles, on, on, on physics laws, then at some point you want to have a model. Why we want to have a model is just for the fun of modeling? No, <coughs> that can be funny, it's also a reason. Uh, but also because we want to have predictive models. Science only has real value to the extent that you can predict the outcome of experiments, that you can say beforehand, well, if you do this and this and this, then I can predict you with my model that this and this will be your observation. Then you have a real, uh, then you have a real progress. It's, it's easy to uh, predict the past, but it's more difficult to, to predict the uh, the future. So uh, only in, with, with real scientific models you can go to that level that you can really anticipate on, on what's going to happen. But it's not easy. Why it's not easy? Uh, because we have to make, in order to do this, uh, we have to make a scientific abstraction. That means replacing a part of the real world by the model. Because the, very often, our real world of, of metals is it's very complex, it's very messy. And this morning we had, uh, and yesterday, we had very interesting discussions, and we could see how, how complicated it is. You have many in um, a metal like steel, you have many different faces, grains, or carbon swirls around everywhere. So it's, it's very difficult to get a, a clear, crisp prick picture of that. So the only way that we can uh, advance in this is by making some type of abstraction. Of course it has to be a relevant abstraction. Um, that means an abstraction that ignores all kind of irrelevant details, but captures the essence in terms of the phenomena that are under consideration. Uh, for example, the, uh, I'm going to give a, a very basic example. Some uh, uh, of you may have heard about the whole patch relation. The whole patch relation is a relation which links the average grain size to the strength of the material. That's something, it's what we call the archetype of structure property relation. Strength proper, grain size, um, uh, is, a, uh, grain size is a structural relation, strength is a mechanical property of the material. So the power of, this, of such a relation is that you don't need to know the size and the shape of each little grain in the material. Huh? There are plenty of, 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 of crystallographic grains or, or grains. That's not important for the strength. The average, um, uh, the average size is important. So you see, that's what I mean with, with these abstractions. Huh? So that's why you have to guide, you have to come to terms with the complexity of the structure. Uh, and here, I, there is a, often a phrase that is ascribed to Einstein, but I looked a little bit deeper in it, and that's 
Uh, that's what I called misquoted from Einstein, and <laughs> because he probably never said this, uh, that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So you need to have the right level of complexity to describe the phenomena that you want to, uh, to model with. So now, how we can make clever abstractions of the microstructure? So as I already said, microstructures are intricately complex. They, had, they uh, manifest themselves, show itself at different length scales, different time scales. If you want to consider the uh, dynamic uh, evolution from uh, picoseconds to, yeah, to, to years, and also different dimensions. Uh, you have uh, uh, models in, in, in different uh, dimensions. I come back to this uh, 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 soon. So we, need, so we need a suitable representation of the microstructure. That's actually, we are going to choose, instead of the real microstructure, a model version of this microstructure. And we can call this, a, very often people nowadays work with what is called a representative volume elements. That is some assembly that extracts certain elements of the microstructure, a, a certain 3D volume that we, we consider as to be representative for the entire microstructure, okay? So this is one way of doing this. Another way of doing this is a statistical distribution function of what we call microstructural state variables. The microstructural state variables are quantities that you relate to the microstructure. For example, the average, the grain size, the grain size distribution or the crystallographic orientation distribution, or the volume fraction of different phases, or the, um, uh, the dislocation density, dislocation density distribution. All these are microstructural state variables. The, uh, the density of solute uh, uh, atoms, carbon atoms in, the, in steel, for example. So, well, I want to emphasize that one of the traditional ways of scientific thought, scientific thinking, to deal with complexity is with statistical methods. So once you describe complex gatherings of all elements in statistical uh, models, you can come to somehow uh, predictive conclusions, like this whole patch relation. At some point, it was established that you don't need to know the size of each little individual grain separately, all its morphology. No, it's average size. It's fine. So that is the average. That's a statistical state variable. Okay? It's the average of a distribution function. Of course, will this tell you the whole story? No, not because there are also, uh, you've heard probably of black swans. These are elements that can be, that are totally outside of the normal distribution of things, but that may play a role. We have to be aware of them, that they exist. You find this, for some who are familiar, uh, with a phenomenon like secondary recrystallization, for example, where you have one single grain, and this grain will grow and consume the entire matrix. It may grow into even a, a single crystal. That's, that single grain, that's kind of a, a black swan. That will be difficult to be described by statistical methods. So like all methods, also statistical methods have their limitation. But for the time being, let's assume uh, that by statistical methods, how far can we, uh, ten, can we go? So um, as I said, let's first, a little, before we go to statistical methods, I want to um, expand a little bit on representing microstructures by what is called representative volume elements. So these are um, two or three D topological reconstructions of the microstructure. Topological means in, in, in spatially distributed, uh, taking into account the, the neighborhoods of the uh, grains. And this may be either based on experimental data. So if you want to do it in 3D, then it's really a lot of work to have a 3D picture of a metallic microstructure. You need to, uh, you can do it with uh, synchrotron radiation, for example, or you need to do 3D microscopy by 
um, uh, slicing and viewing different layers in the material, but that's time uh, consuming and, and very costly. So it's not very easy. So alternatively, we can also um, have statistical characterization and a, vert a synthetic structure generation. So you're going to construct a virtual microstructure in the computer. So like, um, for example, when I had this microstructure, this is obviously an experimental um, uh, measurement. So if the question would be now, how, how can you expand it to three dimensions? How can you, this is a two dimensional section, how can you uh, build up the third dimension? And, and you don't want to do expensive and time consuming measurements, then you may want to develop a, a method, a, a model by itself that generates, that reconstructs a 3D structure based on uh, the uh, 2D image. That's something what some people are, are doing, so, but, uh, and that can be then considered as a, um, oh, sorry, that can be then considered as a representative, a representative volume element. Now, once you have such a representative volume, um, it doesn't stop there, of course not. The, uh, what you want to do is to see how such a representative volume element behaves or how it evolves. So very often, the representative volume element is employed as an object for simulation of microstructural evolution, for example, by uh, full field crystal plasticity models. That's um, used a lot nowadays. What is a full field uh, crystal? Uh, uh, these are some examples, sorry, uh, of uh, RVEs. These are uh, generated, these are synthetically generated 3D microstructures of a two phase steel. Uh, so uh, you do a lot of research on two phase steels. Uh, so here, uh, this is not a measured structure, but it is a micro, this is a computer generated uh, uh, 3D microstructure of which you hope that it is really representative, that it is a real statistically representative uh, um, uh, uh, representation of the microstructure. This was a 3D EBSD image of a uh, 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 cast iron. Uh, that uh, we have made in Ghent by ourselves. And you can see how it's a very uh, wide field. This is one millimeter. So, and here you can see a crack. And um, we can model, we not, not model, we can we visualize this crack. This was a thermomechanical uh, fatigue crack. Um, of course, this is a lot of work. Making such one image for one material, it's like easily three weeks of, of work on, of, of electron microscopy. So it's not very convenient. You're not going to do this for 10 different materials, for example, because otherwise it's, it's, it's too long. So that's why there is a necessity of creating virtual uh, microstructures. Uh, so what can you do then? Suppose that you have such a virtual model. Well, this is some quotation from a, a paper also from the Max Planck group. There is, they developed a very important uh, model which is called Damask. The uh, I forgot the uh, re the full name uh, now. So this is the uh, a computer code that, for example, allows you to uh, once you have the RVE. Uh, this is a, a nano indentation. In fact, so you can actually model then what how the material will respond locally topologically. So the crystal orientation, of course, the shape of the material changes. Uh, you have plastic deformation. And these different colors, they represent uh, different microstructural state variables. That can be crystal orientation, or can be strain, or can be, or, or can be stress. Uh, so this code, which is an open source code, every one of you can, uh, can use it. Uh, this allows you to, to model this. OK. So, um, another example that was recently published was a PhD thesis from uh, Theo Delft, from uh, Caro Sadegiani. And um, so he started, he modeled the, for an IF steel with the same code, the, the uh, Düsseldorf uh, simulation code, uh, cold rolling of up to 75% of an IF steel. So the initial representative volume element consisted of 37 randomly oriented grains. It's not a lot, 37. 
um, and the RVE was subjected to plain strain compression, which comes down to uh, rolling, uh, rolling reduction of 75%. Um, the simulations were using a dislocation density based model, which was implemented in this crystal plasticity, uh, a finite element crystal plasticity model. And the resolution was 960 times 256 cells uh, per, uh, per element. So actually, you can see here that you can model the deformation microstructure with really high, high precision. Um, this is very valuable to, to do this, but the problem is that just for making such a calculation, um, it, it costs about um, yeah, uh, three weeks of CPU time. And this is just for one RVE. So again, this is very valuable from a scientifically point of view, but for more or applied application, for more applied uh, uh, interests, it's difficult. You're not going to, comp because probably uh, the next day you want to know what instead of 75%, what happens if I have 80% reduction or 85% reduction? Well, you have to calculate again um, uh, uh, for three weeks uh, or for some weeks more. Uh, because the, uh, the other thing is that this is, was only for 37 grains. 37 grains is really very, very uh, limited. You could, ar you could argue whether 37 grains are really going to represent the microstructure or not. Uh, so that's why um, I have relatively invested in the alternative representation of microstructures by statistical distribution functions. So that um, starts from what is called a non-topological representation, uh, so, um, which is limited to a chosen set of S microstructural state variables, for example, grain size, crystal orientation, grain boundaries, and grain shape. So you, you make a set of uh, S objects um, which have a certain grain size, which have a certain crystal orientation, uh, which have a certain aspect ratio, for example, which have a certain uh, dislocation density, but you're not going to assemble them in a topological unit like you do with an RVE. You just limit them to a set, a, an, an, and that's the object with which you will work. Uh, and each of such stage variables has, its, of course, its own uh, uh, dimensionality, uh, depending on how it is uh, defined. I mean, if you work with Crystal orientation, for example, it has three dimension. Grain size, it only has one dimension. Uh, dislocation density, it's a scalar. Also, strain, it's a, it's a tensor. Uh, or uh, displacement field, it's, uh, it's tensorial. So you can then define something that is called the local state distribution function. This is a distribution function in the same sense that you know distribution functions of probability. But here we don't have distribution function of probability, we have rather distribution functions of uh, volume fraction because so the H represents this set of uh, state variables. You, if you consider uh, n state variables, then H will be an n-dimensional vector uh, in the n-dimensional state variable space. And here on the right hand side, this is the volume fraction of material that has the state variable within an infinitesimally small environment around H, in the same way that you would define a probability distribution function. Okay? So uh, I didn't invent it. Sorry, I forgot here to give the uh, right um, uh, reference. This comes from the book of uh, Kaladindi and uh, uh, Brent Adams and Dave Fullwood. Um, and so, yeah, I already told this, H denotes the local microstructural state variable. For example, some of you might be familiar, I know, Jay, you're very familiar, uh, if A, H, that's the crystal <coughs> orientation. In case H is just a crystal orientation, uh, then, oh, then we talk about the orientation distribution function. That's what is generally people known as the texture of the material, uh, which is element of the microstructure, but not shown as a topological distribution, shown as a 
distribution function in orientation space. And here you, for example, these are annealing texture of a simple titanium IF steel. This is much simpler than the uh, dual phase steel. This is a single phase uh, ferrite uh, material. And you can see this is the typical texture that you observe after rolling 75% of steel and annealing. It has a, this is what we call gamma fiber texture. So, but if you change the um, rolling reduction from 75 to 80, 85, 90, 95 percent, you can see that these textures change, these distribution functions, because that's what they actually are, they, they change. So actually this also can be, uh, we can nowadays model this, oops, uh, quite straight, in a straightforward manner, but um, it's a, uh, uh, you, you also could, could do this, what I wanted to say, with a RVE model. But it would take you much more time. So this would take you weeks of CPU time. Whereas here, um, oops, sorry. Here you do it in, in uh, seconds of CPU time. That's, that's a big difference. So, uh, seconds and yeah, then you can you can make all these uh, these comparisons. Of course, we don't have that much information. We only have the information of the texture. In this drawing, this corresponds to the color of the grains. Color of the grains represents here their crystal orientation. So, with a statistical distribution, you you uh, methods you you forget about the local topological. Uh, position of each grain and their neighborhood and so on. You don't care about it, but you just, for example, we have considered the marginal distribution of the crystal orientation, which would be then the color distribution compared to, uh, to this. So it's, of course, it's less powerful, but from the perspective of information that you can model, but it's much more powerful uh, from the, uh, uh, the, the time and the cost of the uh, simulation. Of course, these uh, these are pole figures. Uh, these are um, uh, this was for selective laser melted uh, merging steels, which a paper that we presented uh, two years ago. And you can see that we can. Uh, uh, these are the textures of retained austenites and and martensites. These are one are experimental observation and the other are uh, models. Um, this is an example of a paper that was uh, published with uh, Jesus Galan Lopez. Um, and he, uh, here we have, because we are much more familiar with working with the crystal orientation distribution function, the texture. And we have a little bit extended this concept by also adding the grain size to it. So here you have all these different textures. This is, they all belong to the same sample. But what is different is that they correspond to different grain size classes. So here you have the texture uh, for, uh, uh, this is the entire texture. These are the, the texture for the grains, which have a size between 4.5 and 6.4 micrometer. And this is the texture for the grains that belong to the size category, um, what is it, 13.4 to 45.3. You may say, well, what's special about it? Well, nothing that special. The only thing is that we, we condense this information in a mathematical distribution function. So we combine crystal orientation and grain size in one mathematical object, a function. And this is, this is for our purpose here, that's the microstructure. Not that image, but that mathematical function by which you can then do Interesting uh, uh, manipulations, of course. Okay, so why why do we know why do we want all this? Well, because of course there is a. In the end, we are interested in properties of materials. We want to uh, uh, show some uh, relations between mechanical properties and microstructures, like the whole concept of the whole patch relation, the relation between grain size and between strength. And now we are going to expand this, not only between 
grain size and strength, but between other uh, properties and uh, more extensive microstructural functions. And um, we have published last year uh, a paper together with many other people, and there we um, was um, done a cup drawing uh, test. That was the uh, cup drawing is an Im a very important industrial uh, process, uh, which is um, at the basis, for example, uh, of um, can manufacturing. I think most of you know uh, what are beverage cans, uh, but also in uh, 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 body panel manufacturing of cars. It's also uh, deep drawing property. So it's um, sheet for sheet metal, both in steel and aluminium or uh, titanium. Um, the deep drawing property, it's really a very important mechanical property. So a test was done, an experimental test, and uh, this was the initial microstructure. Uh, this was for a uh, 60, uh, 16 aluminium uh, alloy in T4 uh, uh, natural aged uh, condition. So, and uh, you, this has a, 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 a very typical strong cube texture. Uh, actually, I think uh, it should be red, but it is be discolored a little bit. So. Red is typical for cube texture or, uh, orientations. And if you do a, um, do I have a separate picture? Yeah, here. This is a, a cup drawing experiment. So you have a circular blank. And then with a die, you punch through that circle and you obtain a, a cup uh, type uh, experiment, a uh, cup type uh, shape. And what is important, we, uh, uh, this is a force uh, displacement uh, curve. So you see that first the force goes up and then uh, goes down. And you have also here uh, the edges. You have here the, um, the, what is called the ears. Uh, for industrial application, this, these ears should be as small as possible because those, they have to be trimmed. And this is, of course, uh, expensive, lots of material because you have to do this trimming operation. So, uh, it is very important for industrial applications to be able to predict this trimming and to reliably predict it and to be able to predict it for many different steel and aluminium uh, 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 met, uh, uh, grades. Um, here, this is, these are experimental uh, data. Um, these are data of the uh, normalized yield strength and isotropy. These were measured at two different uh, universities. So you have a typical U-shape um, uh, um, evolution. Here, this is the angle with respect to the rolling direction. Eh? So uh, these are all the results of a tensile test. And this is the yield strength in the rolling direction. This is the yield strength in the transverse direction. This is the yield strength under 45 degrees. and uh, under all other uh, orientations. Of course, because of orthorhombic sample symmetry, we only have to look between 0 and 90 degrees, uh, between rolling direction and, and 90 degrees direction. This is a, another plot which is very important. This is the, um, on the vertical axis is the R value. This is a mechanical property which tells you the uh, width to thickness, if you do a tensile test on a, a sheet material, okay, so you're going to extend the length, you're going to reduce the width and reduce the thickness. If you would have an isot, the, the R value is the ratio of the widthness reduction to the thickness reduction. So if you would have a perfectly isotropic material, this R value would be equal to one. That means that for all unit in length, extension, you have the same uh, units in thick, you have half of it is compensated by the thickness reduction and half of it is compensated uh, by the width reduction. Now, most materials, by the way you make them, they are not isotropic. You can see that these R values for aluminum, so they are not equal to one, they are below one. And also these are, uh, you can see that they are anisotropic. So if you do the tensile test along the rolling direction, you have about 0 0.5, but if you do it along the uh, uh, diagonal direction, it's less than 0 0.3. So this means that the material behaves highly anisotropic. And it's in fact this phenomenon that is uh, 
responsible for this earring behavior. So the, the larger the differences here between the maximum and the minimum, the more earring that you will have. So actually what we are trying to achieve here is to have a good prediction of this R value and isotropy because this allows you to predict the, uh, uh, the earring behavior of, of the cup. So I've already shown this. So you see, this is the measured value uh, of the uh, cup between 0 and, and 360. You can see that it's, kind, it's symmetric with respect to this 180 degrees because of the, the, the symmetry of the metal sheet by which you uh, started. Um, now, we need, in order to model this, you need a crystal plasticity model. What is a crystal plasticity model? Uh, a crystal plasticity model, it's a something of continuum mechanics. You know, continuum mechanics is, is the branch of uh, mechanics in which you model material behavior, but from a continuum point of view. You don't consider atoms and molecules. You consider the, the, the material just as a, a continuum. Okay, and um, crystal plasticity tries to do the following. So you know that, most people know, I think, that metals have a very unique selling proposition in, in relation to other metal categories. That is that most of them, to a certain extent, can be plastically deformed at room temperature. That's what makes metals so interesting because plastic deformation is a comparatively very cheap way of bringing a metal in a certain shape. So you can, like I think as children we've all played with clay, huh? so you, you can make all kinds of shapes out of a metal at room temperature if you put enough force. Huh? It will uh, rather deform plastically than break. Uh, ultimately you have fracture, but before fracture you have some uh, plasticity. I know there are many exceptions and so on, metals that don't have, that have brittle behavior, but uh, the interesting metals have plastic behavior. So this plastic behavior, we all know we from our experience, it, it can be quite arbitrary. If you put enough force, you can deform a metal uh, at room temperature, like you, a little bit like you can deform clay, eh, but which you have played. However, at the, if you now go back to the atomic level, uh, a little bit beyond the border of um, uh, continuum mechanics, there's, things are not so simple because on the atomic level, we know that metals deform primarily by gliding these locations. These locations that glide on specific crystal planes in specific direction. For example, in FCC, the, these locations glide on 111 planes in 110 directions. And this is not continuum. There are a number, there is a finite number of crystal planes and crystal directions uh, slip systems, we call them, that can accommodate plastic deformation. So how do you combine this macroscopic world of rather arbitrary uh, uh, plastic deformation in all directions and, and uh, how you'd like to the, on the molecular world, the atomic world, the crystallographic world, the, 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 the rather quantized way of, of strain. Eh? So these two worlds have to be brought into contact with each other and one way of doing this is by crystal plasticity models. I'm not going to, um, uh, to uh, go to much detail. Uh, one such model that we often use is the uh, ALAMEL model. It stands for Advanced uh, LAMEL model. Uh, the interesting aspect is that it's entirely different from a re representative volume element model. We don't, consider, uh, we don't consider individual grains. We don't consider grain boundaries. We only consider crystal orientations. That's a, a, the crystal orientation in reality can be divided over many different grains in the material. So there is a, a, a conceptual difference. And although, so this is a real, it's a statistical way of dealing with the material. So we are going to reduce the material to a set of n different crystal orientations. That's it. And that's what we are going to, to work with. Now, you can see that if you model here uh, the R value, so these are experimental data, 
And these are uh, modeled data. We have two different models, but I'm not going into this. So actually, the correspondence with the R value and hence the earring behavior is quite, uh, quite well in detail. So this means that if you know these sets of n crystallographic grains, this distribution function of crystallographic orientation uh, as a microstructural state variable, this is the, the analog of the grain size in the whole patch relation, that actually, from that point on, if you have a good crystal plasticity model, we can predict you the earring behavior. Uh, so that's a powerful structure property uh, relation. However, it's not, uh, it's not entirely all uh, uh, fun and, and, and happy because this, the strength um, uh, uh, distribution, we don't get it very right. So this is the yield strength evolution as a function of uh, the angle with respect to the rolling direction, and you can see that uh, it's, it's not good. Huh? The prediction is, is, is not good. So uh, there's still a lot of room for improvement, as, uh, especially here. So uh, we try to do uh, various things, and even uh, we, but on the basis of this crystal plasticity methods, we also try to model the, 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 the cup heights, this, this cup ring, you see, and how, how close uh, it, it is, eh? the experimental data and the prediction on the basis of a statistical model. Eh? So this, this didn't take three weeks of CPU time. This took uh, less than an hour of CPU time just to, to calculate it. So here, that is industrially much more relevant. And even we were, at least in this case, I'm not going to generalize this, um, more precise, in fact, than a full crystal plasticity simulation based with uh, RVEs. So mind, e even if these were equally correct, this again would take weeks of CPU time uh, and this, this less than an hour. So that's really an important, powerful way of dealing with, uh, with microstructure. Um, how long am I talking now? Okay. So I, I guess that I'm not going to go into uh, too much uh, detail here. Um, well, one of the uh, powerful things in a model like Alamel, it is that you consider grains pairwise. I said we consider the microstructure as a set of n crystal orientations. And at some point, the model is, to gr is going to group them in pairs. Now, there are many ways in which you can pair two elements of a set out of n elements. In fact, if you want to do this in all possible ways, I think uh, it's n times n minus 1 uh, divided by 2. Uh, so this is, creates a lot of combinations. So that's uh, written here. Actually, that's not what is done in the model. We did something much more... Um, uh, daring, so to say, audacious, we just paired them two by two. Just, we just listed them, for, we, we scrambled all of these orientations, uh, these n orientations, and then we, we just took them uh, one with two, three with four, uh, because we, uh, this of course said that we, we must, n should be an even number, uh, so that we have n divided by two pairs. You could say that uh, this is a a tremendous uh, simplification, because how can you know that exactly these pairs will, will, will appear in the microstructure? Well, uh, we don't know it, in fact. But here you can see that um, the, the sequence of orientations in the input file um, <coughs> may be of importance, but in fact, it does not play a role. And these calculations show it. These are uh, four simulations with four different pairs. Okay, so this is a what I call a topological assumption. Of course, this works only in specific conditions. Uh, suppose that you would, if your n crystal orientations, if they would have consisted of n divided by two orientations of the type A and n divided by two orientations of the type B then it would have made a lot of difference if you consider pairs A, B, A, B, A, B, or, on, or alternatively only A pairs and, and B pairs. 
But that's an extreme case. It doesn't occur in a real material that you have only crystal orientations of two types, A and B. Normally, you have crystal orientations of many different types. And then the topology doesn't seem to play uh, a real big role. Uh, so we also uh, tried some other things to, um, uh, to how to better pair the crystal orientations. Uh, but in the end, we proved that, in fact, it was not that uh, sensitive. Um, we even try to extract the pairing from the real 3D microstructure. So if you measure a microstructure in 3D and it's a real huge chunk uh, of material, and this is a uh, IF steel which we measured in 3D by EBSD. So this is uh, one millimeter by one millimeter by uh, 100 micrometer. Uh, such one measurement takes easily uh, three weeks. And why we did this? Well, to, to check our topological hypothesis. Because if you have this real 3D um, microstructure, then you can extract the real topology of how the material uh, uh, really occurs in reality. Uh, um, and then we can compare it. Uh, well, this is uh, not important. Actually, these are simulations with all these different topologies. And what shows you here with these, uh, these are on the vertical axis, the R value. This is for steel. This is not for aluminum. Eh? This is the first example that I show was for aluminum, where you had this typical V-shape. Here, um, steel has a different shape. You have a, what we call a six-year behavior. By the way, you can see that the R values for steel are much higher than for aluminum. The R values for steel are of the order, in this case, uh, uh, it goes from 1.8 to uh, even higher than, than, than 2.5. That's why steel, in general, has a much better deep drawability than, than aluminum. That's one of the big challenges now with uh, car body manufacturing. You know that in future, probably we will go to electrical driven uh, uh, cars and therefore the vehicle does to, must have seriously reduced in weight and most of the E uh, vehicles are um, uh, made out of aluminium. One of the challenges is that aluminium is much less deep drawable than, than, than steel and you can see this exactly with the R values. Coming back to my story, that is that even if you have the true topology that we put in our ALML model, the result of our simulations of the R values are not that much better. So actually, it shows that to some extent, the R value is a mechanical property that is not really sensitive between certain uh, limits to the uh, topology of the microstructure. So in term, going back to our, I like this metaphor, going back to all our whole patch relation, the neighborhood ship is something like the shape of the grains. If you want to predict the strength of the material, you don't really need to know this. You just, within certain limits, you can simply do with the average um, uh, diameter of the grains, whatever shape they have. Of course, if they have a very extreme shape, like a, a very elongated, bamboo-like structures, that's something else. Then you are beyond the, 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 the boundaries of that uh, uh, approximation. OK, so the conclusion of the simulation was that the R value profiles, uh, except in some occasions, um, that they are, well, that actually this omega t is the, uh, uh, the average misorientation. Uh, uh, yeah, that was also interesting. We kind of, um, here, if you have um, a set of 100 or 1,000 crystal orientations, um, how can you order them so that the average distance between the orientation is of a preset value? That is not a trivial question. That is a little bit of the, uh, have you ever heard about the salesman problem? If you have a, a salesman, and you want to, he has to visit 100 customers of a day, which are randomly spread uh, over space. How can you determine the road that uh, has the minimum amount of distance that you have to drive in order to address each of the salesmen once? Well, a similar problem we had to solve here. 
because we have a set of not 100, but uh, 500 or 1,000 crystal orientations, and we can define a distance between those crystal orientations, a, a metric for the distance. So how can you order them pair by pair, so that if you jump from the, the first to the second, and the second to the third, and so on, you have the, the minimum distance, or the maximum distance, or any distance that you preset. This you, it's a very, it's a problem which uh, has been solved by a, uh, an Indian master, uh, uh, Alim Pirana, from a uh, student from, from TU Delft of mine, and he used something, uh, the Hungarian method, which is uh, uh, published, uh, well, a uh, long time ago. Of course, it is an approximation. You cannot solve this problem uh, uh, mathematically uh, exact. You have to uh, be happy with a certain approximation. Well, actually, we did all this work to find out that in the end, the result is not so much sensitive to the uh, real uh, uh, topology. OK, so I think I have convinced. So here, what happens with the, um, you may say, uh, you have talked a lot about the things that you can do, but you didn't talk a lot about the problems that you could not solve. Well, there were still about 10 slides about uh, things that we have tried to um, to better model the strength and isotropy, but to be honest, they all failed. Uh, so um, we we are not uh, we have to redo. Uh, well, we have to continue working on this uh, thing. And actually, uh, we at this point we think that the yield strength and isotropy um, is is dependent on other sources of what I call microstructural anisotropy, which we were not considered. We only considered, in this case, the crystallographic orientation and the grain size. And perhaps it really has to do with how these locations are configured uh, with respect to in, uh, each other in the microstructure. But we didn't model this, uh, because that's another uh, issue. So. In summary, we could say that the spatial anisotropy, uh, well, this is something that, that we tried, of particles represented. Uh, no, but I, I didn't deal uh, with it. So um, yeah, sorry. Th this was the summary of the things that uh, we tried, but which all failed. Uh, so that's what I uh, have the conclusion here. I think I'm going to stop here, because I used up most of my time. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I still want to uh, leave some time for you to, uh, to ask questions. Thank you for your attention. So I just want to show one extra image. Uh, that image, that is, uh, Jay, you know what it is. It's the city center of Ghent. So please, if you have a possibility, to pass by, uh, be my guest, and then we go and make a walk uh, uh, on the riverside. OK? Thank you. First part of your talk, you were talking of RVE, representative volume element. So how does one choose representative volume? How small or big should it be? You're talking of representative can, can you repeat volume the RVE. Yeah, yeah. So how does one choose that? I mean, what should decide how much volume element should be chosen? Well, I only talked about RVE to say for the rest of my talk that I, I would not work with RVEs. So, the RVEs that I showed here, the examples, they were not mine. We didn't work with RVEs, so that they were purely from the literature. But you're absolutely right, that is already the first question. That's really part of the big problem. How are you going to make such an RVE? If you decide to do it in purely experimental ways, you want to have a 3D image of your microstructure, it's not simple. And even if you have it, you can never be sure, is it large enough or is it, uh, is it too large? Because calculation times will uh, uh, ramp up uh, uh, greatly. So everything what I told afterwards is actually our attempts that we do, our tools, 
in order to avoid to have to, do, to, to deal with this problem by working with statistical functions and that if you do this, you don't need an RVE. So that was my, I started with RVEs to say that we, we, we don't, uh, we are not going to work with them. It's too difficult. Uh, microstructurally, how uh, titanium is better? Because we call it as a stainless steel first, and uh, titanium is considered to be the more better than corrosion resistance in the form of steel. Yeah, microstructurally, great. how you can uh, explain no. this? I didn't deal with titanium in no, this study. No, it was no, aluminium. Also you I mentioned something titanium. Yeah. I said yeah. we could do titanium, but I didn't show any results of, about titanium. Um, actually, to answer your question, the, if I said we can use the method of microstructural state variables, we have to limit ourselves. Here, we are only considering a mechanical property, which is essentially the R value. So I don't say anything about corrosion. It's totally outside the scope of this. Uh, this study. If you want to study uh, corrosion, you have to study other microstructural state variables. And then the, the other main message that I want to convey is that what we call the material, we reduce it to a set of discrete n state variables. It's in this case it's a set of n critical orientations. And if it's titanium, well, they will have to be represented for titanium. If it's aluminium, they will be have to represent it for aluminium. If it's steel, for steel. So we reduce the real reality of the microstructure, which is absolutely complex, daunting, um, scary, to a, some basic, basic set of variables. Huh? So it is as if you reduce a let's say, a weather system, the Earth atmosphere, which is a very complicated system, we say, well, forget about that. We are just going to consider the temperature, the temperature distribution. This is for us the atmosphere. Is it enough? I don't know. It can be enough for in function of the property that you want to, uh, to, to consider. Huh? So. You, uh, you made a great case for how the mean field models give you a great saving in time compared to the RVE. Uh, but you also mentioned that at the core these are all statistically based. Uh, so is there an inherent assumption about what sort of distributions those should be for these to work or for what kind of distributions should this work or not work? In principle, um, the, the method does not, the, the method that I present um, are not, should work for all kinds of, of, of distributions. But um, in any case, yes, there is a, also, if you work with statistical methods, um, let's think of crystal orientations, okay? So a crystal orientation, I'm going back to this image that I showed, the EBSD image, uh, the simple EBSD image. This, well, I say this is not a microstructure. Actually, if you reduce the microstructure to a set of n crystal orientation, of course, your first question will be, what is n? How much? 5, 10, 500, 5,000, 5 million? So there is no a priori answer to this. The way that we do this now is the following. We measure such an EBSD with a certain microstructure, of, of course, of which we assume that it is large enough, for example, 500 by 500 micrometer that has a few thousands of grains in it. Huh? Then we have, let's say, 5,000 grains in that. From those 5,000 grains, we are going to make a continuous distribution function. So we sift from, in reality, it's discrete. Huh? So you have many different grains in the real material, millions and millions. So we are going to make a continuous function out of that from the one that we have measured. And that continuous function, we are going then to, to take a sample of that, a sample of n representatives. You come back to the same thing, of course. What is representative? Well, the way to test this, you start, if you think you have the real continuous distribution, 
and you sample it in n orientations, if you then from those n sample orientations, you recalculate back the continuous distribution, they should be the same, or at least that should be convergent. So n should be large enough to represent the continuous distribution from which you have started. And how do you know that your initial continuous distribution is the real distribution? Yeah, there is no exact answer, just large enough, I would say. So. But in some ways, it's also like the RV, right? So from what I understand, you start yeah. with this. Let's say you're not assuming a distribution, but you're changing, using this as the base to build your discrete distribution. Yes, but so it's much the, easier. Yes, for an I, RVE, I see, it's in 3D, whereas here we crystal orientation you can measure in 2D. So you reduce the dimension, but the basic idea still remains the same because what you start with here huh. is your seed for how do you how you discretize this. Uh, yeah, but the, 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 the difference is not so much in the sampling, that is true, whether you use an RVE or the microstructural state variables, you need to sample the real microstructure, which is always, you have to make statistical assumptions for that. The difference is beyond that. Once you work with RVE, you continue working with the sampled uh, objects, the, the three-dimensional shape of the individual grains and how they are topologically fit into each other, whereas in, in the mean field method, that's why we call this uh, the, the RVE method, it's also called the full field metal, uh, method, whereas in the mean field method, you're going to work with distribution functions. Thank you. So, can we have a distribution function which can quantify the thermodynamic non-equilibrium defects, vacancies, dislocations, stacking faults, and everything? Uh, technically, the answer is yes. In principle, yes. Why not? Of course, it's, it's possible. The, 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 the main idea would be that this trans if you have a distribution function that characterizes your initial state of the material, so then you do something, you give it a kneeling treatment or a mechanical treatment, and then you, you, this produces a final state of the distribution function. So if you have a, a, a real reliable model, it should be able to predict you from the initial state, the final state. Like we can do this for, for plasticity, as, so, as long as you're interested in only crystal orientations, we can do it quite well. It's perfectly possible in, on paper. In reality, it depends, of course, in how good and how deep is your understanding of the thermodynamical principles. And I think we have to say there is an important difference between equilibrium thermodynamics, where the system goes to uh, a stable state, initial state, to a stable final state, which can be quite well understood by thermodynamic models. But of course, in metals, very often, we deal with non-equilibrium uh, processes. Uh, so you start, at best, you start from an, a, a stable initial state, and you do something, and you end with a state which is far out of equilibrium. So there, thermodynamics is not going to teach us the evolution laws of such a system. So that, that is the main roadblock. There again, a steel which can be used for uh, deep drawing of uh, cups. We have seen the aluminum alloy anyway, but, but steel, steel. Yeah, yeah. Is there any steel which can be deep drawn into the cups? Of course, the, the main steel that is used for that is IF steel, interstitial free steel. The steel that I've been uh, showing, this has a, a very good deep drawing uh, properties. Uh, what about the earring effect present there? The? Earring, earring effect. What do you mean with yield? Earring yield? effect. Earring yeah. effect. Yes. Ah, uh, well, the, that's why, look. I gave here some examples. This is an, uh, of textures of an IF steel, interstitial free steel. Um, and 
the good deep drawability properties are results that you have all crystal orientations on this line. And if you have a perfect line on this, you will have no ears. That's why this steel is especially made by the steel industry to obtain good drawability. And with good drawability means that you can make caps with long, uh, with, with uh, uh, high uh, uh, limiting drawing ratio, this is called. But also that you don't have ears. And actually, the earring behavior, it scales with the intensity distribution along this fiber. Like you can see, this is very good. This is much worse, because here you have a maximum. So if you deep draw this steel, you will have a strong earring behavior. If you deep draw this steel, you will have close to no earring behavior. You don't agree? Yes. Pardon? And finally, the texture factor, which uh, many of your paper cites, yeah. can we use this texture factor as, uh, uh, I mean, uh, as uh, uh, a measurement technique? Uh, to quantify any of the parameters here instead of R value. Yeah, but the, uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean with texture factor. Uh, the, the texture is the orientation distribution function, which is a function in 3D space of crystal orientation. And you can derive from that 3D function many factors, uh, integrals or uh, ratios. And uh, actually, but the best way to predict the ear, how to go from this to this cup draw, do you remember the cup drawing prediction? You need a crystal plasticity model uh, for that. So, and that's, um, it's, it's quite uh, complicated. So there is no one single simple formula. Eh? There is not a formula that you can uh, 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 predict you the earring behavior straight away from the texture. But there is a clear path how to go from texture to uh, earring behavior. That is, that is true. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, I believe the question that I'm asking would be related to the uh, functions that you have sh uh, not shown in the earlier slides. It's about the phase transformation in this function. Uh, maybe you were uh, about to discuss this in the later part of your slides. Yeah, I didn't actually, because lack of time, um, there was a second part in my uh, presentation, which, sorry, um, which all was about phase transformation. Um, unfortunately, I, I had to skip this. Uh, you see here, um, but it would take me some, yeah, some fifth, some 16 slides more <laughs> and uh, that would be. So the question would be, uh, how do you uh, use some more functions which would help us uh, uh, identify there are phase transformations? What are the models that can help us predicting phase transformation? There are many models. What do you want to know about phase transformation? That's the, very, that's the first thing. You want to, if you want to compare the grain size before transformation or after transformation, do you want to model the kinetics of the grain uh, of the phase transformation? Do you want to model the carbon content of the phase transformation? Or do you want to model the change of crystal orientation during phase transformation? All these things are different. Or you want to, so that's the first thing that you, or you want to model everything. But everything is going to take you a lot of time and it's probably not possible. So you will have to make some, some choices. What, what do you want to model? Phase transformation is a very complicated process or com can be a complex process. There are different types of phase transformation. And you have a starting microstructure and a finishing microstructure as a function of time. And um, the model that I have, that in this part of the presentation that I did not give, um, this focuses on the change of texture. You have an initial texture and you have a final texture. And that model can uh, predict from the initial texture the final texture, but not the kinetics. It doesn't give you anything about the time it needs. It doesn't give you anything about the temperature, uh, uh, that, that, that you, uh, the temperature dependence. So, there is no one single 
phase transformation model. There are many, many different phase transformation models that predict you or simulate you various aspects of phase transformation. for enlightening us with this uh, excellent talk on crystallographic moldings. Uh, now, it's pa as a part of our university culture, it gives us pleasure uh, in facilitating, facilitating our speaker. I request uh, Professor Ganshyam Krishnagaru uh, and our Dean uh, Dibaka, Professor Dibaka Das and uh, Professor Jagotam Garu, please come onto the stage to facilitate our speaker. Thank you. Wait, let's take a picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one more item. <laughs> My goodness. Oh, thank you, thank you, sir, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot, it was my pleasure. Thank you, Jay, thank you. Thank you, sir.